In Herman Melville's classic novel, Moby Dick, Captain Ahab wonders, is Ahab Ahab? Is it I, God, or who that lifts this arm? But if the great sun move, not of himself, but is an errand boy in heaven, nor one single star can revolve, but by some invisible power, how then can this one small heart beat, this one small brain think thoughts, unless God does that beating, does that thinking, does that living, and not I. Moby Dick could have prevented the financial crisis, <laughs> and that's not as crazy as it sounds. Ahab didn't own his actions. He thought they were not his, but God's. And never for a moment did he stop to consider the collateral damage that would arise from his obsession with taking the life of the whale, Moby Dick. This is a kind of prophecy, a window into our own contemporary madness, but we don't pay enough attention. I'm a banker and an English major, and I believe literature can help us solve many challenges in banking and in the world at large. And I know in my bones that if we make the time to read Melville or Dickens or any literary fiction, that its power will become clear. What's that power? Literature transports us to other places and other times, but as importantly, it slips us into the minds and hearts of people very different from our own. It allows us to imagine and to empathize. During the U.S. financial crisis, banker became a dirty word, because we bankers did not collectively live up to people's trust. We became obsessed with our own missions, ignoring the potential dangers. As one appraiser famously said of a bank, it was the Wild West. If you were alive, they would give you a loan. Actually, I think if you were dead, they would still give you a loan. <laughs> Post-mortem analysis of the financial crisis pointed to a culture of groupthink, of homogenized, unchallenged decision-making. It arose because there was a stunning lack of diversity of thought among many in the most powerful positions. Ahab acted in a bubble, too, blind to and unrepentant about the cost. In his fiery eyes of scorn and triumph, you then saw Ahab in all his fatal power. Fatal power. Because not only did Ahab die, but every man on his ship, save one, was killed. I know this isn't a perfect analogy. The financial crisis wasn't fatal for most. The majority of bankers weren't sunk, but we can agree that its wreckage was enormous and its impact reverberates to this day. So, what if more bankers had been thinking about Captain Ahab? What if they had seen the seeds of ruin is in his obsession? Perhaps some might have changed course. Perhaps some might have listened to a whistleblower. Perhaps some might have acknowledged that they were blinded by huge profit or by a lack of empathy. Perhaps some might have recognized in the opening quote their own denial of ultimate responsibility. God does that beating, does that thinking, does that living, and not I. Maybe more bankers should have been reading let's say, Charles Dickens' Great Expectations. I looked at the stars and considered how awful it would be for a man to turn his face up to them as he froze to death and see no help or pity in all the glittering multitude. Maybe the reader of those words will have taken pity and not approved that subprime loan for a frail elderly woman. This applies far beyond bankers. 
Let's imagine an overworked oncologist finding herself distanced from her patients and their loved ones and coming across this passage in Oliver Twist. The fearful, acute suspense of standing idly by while the life of one we dearly love is hanging in the balance. The desperate anxiety to be doing something to relieve the pain which we have no power to alleviate. The sinking of soul and spirit which our helplessness produces, what tortures can equal thee? Great literature immerses us in the world of others. So imagine my delight upon coming across an article in the New York Times titled, For Better Social Skills, Scientists Recommend a Little Chekhov. The study found that, and I quote, after reading literary fiction, people performed better on tests measuring empathy, social perception, and emotional intelligence. Why? Because, and I quote again, literary fiction leaves more to the imagination. It encourages readers to be sensitive to emotional nuance and complexity. The study suggested a direct effect on empathy of reading for only a few minutes. Hinch me. Let's call that the Melville effect. So as our world keeps shrinking, it's becoming even more critical that we understand those beyond our immediate circles. There's a growing body of science bolstering the importance of empathy in our work and private lives. In medicine, many teaching hospitals now offer empathy and relational science programs to improve patient outcomes, but that also require doctors to read literature. The bottom line is we should all be reading more, and yet far fewer people are reading books. The Pew Research Center reported last year that nearly one quarter of American adults does not read a single book, and had not in the past year. And the number of non-readers had nearly tripled since 1978. That's pretty dire. Now, I'm not prescribing Melville as the antidote to all our problems. What I am advocating is that we make the time to let literature teach us and inspire us. I've found literature to help me and strengthen my resolve to grow and to fine-tune my moral compass. Now, we don't yet know how long the Melville effect lasts, so I'm recommending daily doses. Even a short dip in waters foreign from your own can refresh and illuminate. To quote another wonderful writer, George Eliot, art is the nearest thing to life. It is a mode of amplifying experience and extending our contact to our fellow men beyond the bounds of our personal lot. I'm challenging you to harness the power of literature. Once you've done it, you won't be able to stop. Thank you.